We are animals that are born to make things. We're homo faber. Nor it used to be with your hands, but now it's with your brain. What is a thing that only you can do? And then who is a person who can teach you how to do that thing? My next two guests need no introduction. The New York Times should probably just put a hold on the bestseller list for both of them. We made the New York Times bestseller list again. Oh my God, how wonderful. They're prolific authors, modern day philosophers, and they practice what they preach. I'm talking, of course, about Ryan Holiday and Robert Greene. Robert Greene wrote The 48 Laws of Power, which has sold 1.2 million copies worldwide. The book is so powerful that it's been banned by various prisons in the US. For someone to take like like dense ideas and make them accessible to like people in jail and people who haven't read a book since high school. To me, that's just like Tom Brady level dominance of a profession. Taking it all the way for the win. He's been heralded as a second coming of Machiavelli, but since then he's written books like Mastery, The Laws of Human Nature, and The Daily Laws. Ryan actually got his start doing research for Robert. Ryan was like 19, he liked my books. He wanted to know if I needed any help. Ryan is the maestro of controversial marketing. A college dropout, he became the director of marketing at American Apparel when it was the fastest growing clothing brand in the US. He then went on to write, trust me, I'm lying about mainstream media malfeasance and bad incentives. He's written various other hits like The Obstacle is the Way, Ego is the Enemy, and most recently, Courage is Calling. But perhaps one of the greatest services Ryan has performed for modern society is making the Stoics, people like Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, accessible for the average person. Before you move on in this video, it is a stoic principle that you often must take upfront pain in order to gain long-term pleasure. In this case, rip the band-aid off, hit the subscribe button, and forever enjoy the intellectual fruits of American alchemy. In this wide-ranging interview, we talk about everything from creativity and where ideas come from, to virtue and fortuna, the Machiavellian concepts of skill and chance, to the underrated silver linings of a global pandemic. Namely, that it caused a lot of people to have hard conversations with themselves about what they actually want in life. Without further ado, from Bastrop, Texas, please enjoy this winding philosophical conversation with this week's amazing American alchemists, Ryan Holiday and Robert Greene. Different parts of the brain have different activities. <laughs> well, you know that, don't you? Maybe you should interview me. In 1995, I'm in Italy on this job. I didn't have much success. I was 36. And so I met this man there, Joost Elfers. And one day we're walking in Venice, Italy. It's a beautiful sunny day, and he's asking me if I have an idea for a book. And I'm kind of happy, and I improvise what turns into the 48 Laws of Power. Now, there's a set of circumstances there that could have easily never have happened. Mm -hmm. I could have easily not gone to Italy for this job that my friend was offering me. It was a bit of a risk. We might not have taken that walk in Venice in which I improvised an idea that just suddenly came to me. I was slightly suicidal. I had to write a book. Yeah. So, yeah, I, if it had happened when I was 25, I wouldn't have worked out. Yeah. So the circumstances were right. But there was something almost fateful about me meeting him. Well, you, you, I feel you needed all those years of getting kicked around to I write did. that exact, I did. exact book. And so it almost is if, I've had this since, since I was a kid, and it's probably going to sound ugly or stupid, but almost a sense of destiny. Yes. Like things, at certain moments you feel despairing, but in the back of your mind you know that there's something working out in there yeah. and it's going to happen for a reason and you're going to make it work for you i, I believe that as well I, Even, I, I love uh plato's dialogue with mina where he says all, all knowledge is, is recollection yeah yeah and i think there's something too when you're writing do you ever feel this right where you like sit down and it just sort of comes out like where does that come from there is kind of an otherworldliness to well, the creative process well, totally the 48 laws was like that to this day i can't understand how it came out of me it was like a baby that just went boop, like well, that and you describe all of this at the beginning of the daily laws and it almost yeah. what it reminded me of when i was reading it was like it was like a girardian uh revelation or something where a lot of the you know people great authors in fact have revelations before their their great works and you were at a low point and yeah there was some sort of hierophany that occurred or something. Yeah, yeah, but like the weirdness of the structure, like where did I come up with that from? I don't know what. It's <laughs> just something, it is like the gods 
investing me with an idea. I don't really know where it came from. I think it comes a little bit from like the Torah mm -hmm. and from the I Ching or something. I don't know, but that weird structure. Well, the, 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 you know, the etymology of the word genius in its original Latin is, is a tendent spirit. Yeah. And so, okay, here's genius. a crazy idea. And you do, tell me if, you know, I'm wildly off. Here's very speculative, a little woo woo, but <laughs> so this is sort of a, this would be like a platonic idea, but he says that the, the birthing process is a traumatic sort of forgetting process and that we do have immortal souls. And, and so your, your, your body is sort of almost a, a limited prism of what is in a default state of omniscience. And so your ego is, is somehow blocking the default state of omniscience. You engage in some sort of process that subdues the ego and you become a more porous sort of receptacle for the thing that's supposed to hit you, the, the, the default state or whatever. The, the idea that, some, that the creative process is really about removing the blocks yeah. or almost like in, in Buddhism, they talk about willful will. Mm -hmm. Like it's about removing the trying and the intention and then it, whatever it is, takes over. That I think there's very much something to that. Yeah. What, what do you think? Well, yeah, it's a lot of what I'm talking about in the sublime. The process of, of technology and science and our evolution is to become more impermeable, mm. to live in that kind of castle or citadel where we're protected within our ego from the outside world and protected from any kind of outside influences. Mm. And that there's a great danger in that and that we've lost something very elemental. The idea of, of as he said, when you kind of let down the defenses and you stop trying so hard, some kind of your best ideas come to you. And in mastery, I actually tried to explain some of the neuroscience behind that. Oh, interesting. What is the neuroscience behind? That? Well, you're working really, really hard on something. You're evolving, creating all this, all this information. And, and in your brain, all these neural pathways are connecting. And that's unconsciously. But consciously, nothing is happening and you're getting frustrated. You've almost learned too much. You've almost thought too deeply into it, and you're kind of blocked, right? And then you step away from it for a day or something, and you let go, and all of those connections that are happening unconsciously now reach the conscious mind, mm -hmm. and you become aware of, a, of the perfect idea that had been there the whole time, mm -hmm. but you were blocking it by being too intense and too focused on one way of doing it, yeah. right? Frustration is a, is a good sign. Frustration is a sign that you're going to be turning the corner at some point. If you give up, then that, that's the worst thing that can happen to you. Yeah. Yeah. How did 50th Law come about? 50 Cent was just this massive fan of 48 Laws of Power. and Well, the book had a big um, impact in the hip-hop world initially, yeah. which I didn't really know until a couple of years later. Tons like, of hip-hop artists love you. Yeah, I know, <laughs> and it's very weird, you know, just a middle-class Jewish kid from L.A. Yeah, I think that's every middle-class Jewish guy from <laughs> L.A.'s I dream. Know, I know, exactly. <laughs> the first time I heard about it was an interview in Playboy magazine in like 2000, 2001, where Jay-Z was interviewed and he quoted the 48 Laws of Power. I went, whoa, you know? I was so much happier about that than hearing about Wall Street people being interested in the book, because yeah. that's really more my style. So anyway, 50 had been introduced to it by his manager, and he was a huge fan early on, and he, he claimed that it really kind of helped rescue his music career after he got shot. Wow. And so it was like 2005, and a guy named Mark Gerald, who's 50's literary agent, contacted me, phone call out of the blue saying, 50 Cent wants to meet you. <laughs> whoa, okay, whoa, you yeah. know, sure, why not? Yeah. And it was like something out of The Godfather, because it was in the back room, and 50 had his whole entourage there. <laughs> and I was like the one kind of nerdy white guy amongst all these people. Yeah. And I was kind of mesmerized by his bling. He had the most <laughs> insane bracelet, yeah, this diamond bracelet that just was like, God damn, what is that? And then we started talking, and you know, I just felt very comfortable around him. He's a very easygoing guy. He's yeah. very down to earth. You know, he wasn't thuggish or mean or manipulative or anything. Yeah. He was very sweet. And we were talking about war and strategy. He was dealing with all these beefs with like the game, and we were kind of going back and forth. And I could see that he was. He was really quite a quite a good strategist. Yeah. I think they were angling for a book. 
I think mastery is actually just a great through line in general for, for this interview because it was kind of the blueprint for, for, for you, Ryan, for what you did with, with Robert, where he, he sort of was your mentor, and I think you, you learned a lot through osmosis, and then you kind of came in, into your own. So one, one analogy is, uh, you know, uh, Verrocchio and, and Da Vinci. Is, is Ryan going to be your Da Vinci? Is he, is he going to surpass you? How is your relationship evolved? He's already surpassed me. <laughs> you know, the whole thing in mastery is to the master goes the knife, mm-hmm. right? It's the Spanish expression. <laughs> so you learn bullfighting or sword fighting so well mm-hmm. that at some point you're going to stab the master and kill him yeah. and you're going to take over his position. <laughs> Robert is like the gold standard for what it's pot like i think people will be reading the 48 laws of power and mastery like a hundred years from now not just have i not surpassed him but he keeps moving the goalpost yeah. further and yeah. further yeah. um like we were talking about the laws yeah. of human nature that book is sold what like a half a million copies yeah. like over half a million. what's so amazing to me about it is that it tells people what they don't want to hear like when you read about the secret or something you mentioned, it's like, it well, of course the secret sells 20 million <laughs> copies. It's like, you don't have to do any work. You just yeah. have to <laughs> tap into the right energy and you'll get what you want. <laughs> yeah, right? right. Like, so for someone to take like dense ideas or like stories about people whose names no one can pronounce mm-hmm. and be able to not just make them accessible to like powerful people, but also like people in jail mm-hmm. and people who haven't read a book since high school. Mm-hmm. To me, that's just like, that's like Tom Brady level, yeah. like dominance of a profession. Taking it all the way for the win! And it feels like, speaking of Robert moving the goalposts, it feels like you have progressively cut out BS in your life. You know, you, you've, you've moved to Austin, uh, you could be in LA, New York, kind of lost in the sauce if you wanted to be. And I feel like you focused more and more on writing uh, as opposed to other sort of, you know, public speaking and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, guess, I mean, the pandemic was definitely illustrated for me i don't know if you found this robert but it was like when life stripped a bunch of stuff away like i thought i was productive i thought i was pretty focused but you're really it's like you know like sometimes your computer freezes and then you realize like all this stuff was running in the background that you didn't realize was slowing it down it's a great analogy 2020 was like a hard reboot and then you're like wow like is way faster like i like when i was writing courage it was the in some ways the easiest book I ever wrote. And it was like, I was the most connected and sort of like in a state as optionality comes back in, the thing will be like, how do you actually keep it out? That's why nobody's going back to work. You see all the, you know, uh, or they moved or they moved because they're like, Oh, I can live wherever. And I don't have to, you know, slave away in some cubicle. And, you know, I can, I can kind of start my own thing. And so that, that is, I think an underratedly really good, thing about COVID as horrible as it is. <laughs> no, I was reading yeah. about some people that just got another job during the pandemic. Like uh-huh. they, they were like, my job was so inefficient day to day that I could actually do another, like if you let me do it the way I want to do it, I can do two full-time jobs. Right. And I think people are waking up to the fact that they're, you know, a lot of these jobs are, are BS. You know, yeah. there's, a, there's a great book actually by a guy named David Graeber who recently passed away called Bullshit Jobs. And it's like 99% of people if you pull them, say that their jobs are BS. He talks about, I think, like a clerk that like dies at his desk and nobody finds him for like seven days. Like really sad, but also, you know, very, yeah. you know, reflective of the reality. Excuse me. I think people are waking up to like, you know, maybe they, they do have a greater, a greater calling. Or but. also it's like, oh, life is way too short to live in a place that I hate mm-hmm. or like a house that I hate. Like yeah. people are like this, the kitchen in our house makes me unhappy. Yes. Like this is... This is why we argue. You bought me about a steak? Yeah. You have to design your life mm-hmm. to be conducive to what you're trying to do. You can't just be kind of reactive. In some sense, it's a it's a luxury to say a lot of, of this course. stuff. And if, if, if you're a young person in this country now, what would you tell them to do? I mean, is, is the apprenticeship model the best model now? College, to me, feels like kind of a racket. Well, I think the first two sections in Mastery are, like, I think, very timeless and but also work especially now which is like what is your life's task like what are you actually meant to do what is a thing that like only you can do and then who is a person who is doing that thing or can teach you how to do those things Mm. if you get those two things right like everything else is you can you can get a lot wrong after you do those two things Mm -hmm. and be really successful but if you 
don't get those two things right, then you're kind of fucked. And I, th- I feel like millennials specifically have this sort of endless optionality thing that like makes it, it's very hard. Even like I think about my own life and like I worked for Charlie Rose, I worked for Jon Stewart. Now I'm interviewing people. And like, I, pr- I probably just should have started interviewing people after that, you know, but then I ended up in all these sort of, it was like, pre- honestly, like prestige trap or something. And, uh, and then I, I had some calls actually over the pandemic with you, Robert, and you mm-hmm. were incredibly helpful. And yeah, I- exactly. What's written in mastery. Like, what did you do as a kid and, mm-hmm. and what do you stray towards sort of naturally? So, well, it's, it's what I tell people is you have to have an overall framework for what interests you. I knew it since I was eight years old that I wanted to be a writer. Mm. So I had the overall framework. And so I'm 22, 21, and I have to go out into the wide world. So I go into journalism, and I hate it. And then I quit, and I decide I'm going to be a novelist. And I'm wandering around Europe writing these novels that I never finished, that never really amounted to something, although I've reread them recently, and they're actually not so bad. Then I come to Hollywood. I'm writing screenplays. I'm writing treatments for other people. I'm continually writing and continually learning. So I had an overall framework that made me do all these different things that gave me all these disparate skills, right? But what happens with a lot of people is they don't have that framework, and that's what's so goddamn depressing about them. You know, and so we have to kind of go through this investigative process like I did with you. You you. You had a pretty relatively clear idea. But the sense of you have no connection to yourself, to what Maslow calls your impulse voices, Uh those voices inside saying, I'm drawn to this. This is what I was like as a kid. I'm naturally attracted to this subject. To have no antennae that kind of beeps off and tells you what that is, is to me very, very depressing. With social media... Kind of, and you're so involved with other people telling you what's interesting, it's even harder to connect with who you are and what makes you different from all of the mm-hmm. other people. Yeah, the, the, the social media does have this crazy infinite mirror, almost homogenization effect. Well, I think it's also like people get distracted by like outcomes. So like they're attracted to like the fame yes. that a person has or the reputation a person has. Right. Even though those things are the byproduct of the craft that yeah. they mastered, right? You said the, the excrement of the Oh yeah, no, that's a Bruce like, that's a Bruce Dickinson quote. Fame is the excrement of creativity. Uh-huh. It, he's like it's the the it's sludgy the, byproduct that yeah. comes out of the other side. Exhaust. Right? But I think what social media has done is made fame itself seemingly That's a goal right. Yeah. right or that that it's it's just it's separated it out because there are people who are famous for not doing anything and and people always say life isn't fair but almost on the flip side of that when you do do the introspection and you do follow that inner voice i feel like at least anecdotally over long time horizons when i see somebody do that things kind of work out like more than you would expect. Like it, it, there are definitely edge cases and like, you know, chance sort of things that happen, but things work out more often than not if somebody does that hard work. Yeah. I mean, and, and like, it's also pleasurable to pursue the thing that you love doing yeah. and are good at. Right. So it's like you get the guaranteed win of yeah. like enjoying it. Uh-huh. Then you get the pretty predictable outcome of like, if you do it long enough and try long enough, you'll be successful at it. But, but people want to have done the thing. I, I'm sure you hear from people like this all the time. You real, they're like talking to you about this book project and then you realize like, oh, you don't want to write a book. You want to have a book, right? Like right, right, right. You, you don't actually like doing it. You just want whatever you think comes from having done it. I see that with entrepreneurs. It's like, you just want to show up to Summit Series and say you're the CEO of blah, blah, blah. But you, you want to have a successful to, company. You yeah. don't have an idea for a company. No. You definitely don't want to be running a company. No. And having yeah. it is like so empty. You get there and it just, what do you what do you have? So I try and tell people, you have to change your idea, your concept of pleasure. People only have the sense of pleasure, particularly now, that it has to be immediate, that they have to get quick gratification. They need quick hits, like in video games or whatever. They've been programmed yeah. that the easier and the quicker they can get that pleasurable hit the better it is. But I'm trying to say, to take those three years and to write a book like Ryan does Mm -hmm. gives you a much deeper thrill, a much more important 
sense of pleasure, what I would call fulfillment, yes. than just having that empty, I'm suddenly the CEO of a company and I'm famous and I'm on Instagram. It's so empty, it doesn't lead anything. It's just going to make you more depressed yeah. in the end. But the sense that you've actually built something yourself leads to the deepest pleasure that a human can right. have. I'm sorry to say yes. that the sense of accomplishment of creating something from nothing, from building something, is to me the highest pleasure that a human can have because we are animals that are, that are born to make things. Yeah. We're homo faber. We're the animal that makes things, that produces, that creates. That's why we're the species that we are. Nor it used to be with your hands, but now it's with your brain. What's always struck me as interesting about you in general is the 48 Laws of Power. If I were to like guess the person who had, had written that, I'd think that they were super cold and, and calculating and not almost mystical in their sense of reality. We've had conversations around Gurdjieff or Uspensky or Rudolf Steiner, these sort of esoteric, weird philosophers that if you read on the face of them, especially in our current kind of modern materialist reductionist paradigm, you know, most people would think they're, they're absolutely crazy and have alternative versions of history and reality that don't make any sense. So how, how do you square those two things? Well, I'm, I've always been interested in outsiders. I'm reading a biography right now of Philip K. Dick. Oh, yeah. You know. Schizo. Geez, totally but, but schizo. Fascinating. But fascinating, world, yeah. Yes. This woman comes to his door one day. Mm -hmm. He's already kind of nuts because of all the amphetamines he's taken. <laughs> and she's wearing a fish necklace, you know, Christian thing. Mm -hmm. And he has this revelation that completely changes his life, that he's now like a prophet yeah. just by seeing this one piece of jewelry. Yeah. He's totally nuts, but <laughs> but I'm fascinated by people whose brains are wired differently. And the, the question about that different wiring is, are you seeing the supernormal or the paranormal? So are you widening the doors of perception, to quote Huxley, or who I guess was quoting William Blake, um, and seeing things that are, are in reality but are outside our kind of narrow myopic scope, or are you just hallucinating? Yeah, is this some mystical connection you have, or are you fucking delusional? Take Kanye yeah. West. Like, yeah. How confusing and difficult must it be yeah. for him not to know what is the bipolar mania yeah. and what is the creative genius? Well, Harriet Tubman never actually freed the slaves. She just had the slaves go work for all the white people. Y'all, we leave it right now. And there, even social feedback shouldn't mean a whole lot in many cases. Like you have, you know, like Bach or something posthumously discovered. Like you can do great things that are totally completely decried while you know while you're alive. It's actually kind of a sad statement that so many entrepreneurs are on the spectrum. Yeah. Not because it's it's great for them, but the point is, oh, everyone else is so conventional yeah. that they can't see these opportunities that were in retrospect pretty obvious. Yes. The only people who feel free or empowered to do that stuff are people coming from either the outsider thing right. or from this more unhealthy place um, because they're, they're not as chained up. Rene Girard has this concept. He talks about the scapegoat. The archetypal scapegoat is an insider outsider. So they're perceived as an insider by uh, people who, who think they're in the out group or marginalized and they sort of want to scapegoat uh, that person. Yeah. But they themselves are, they're sort of an outsider. They they've themselves have been marginalized. They have maybe some sort of shamanic connection uh, to, to, to knowledge. Well, I think... Um Something that culture definitely needs are outsiders. Yeah. So for many centuries, um, Jews in Europe played that role because they were kept outside of all of the major, you know, professions. Mm -hmm. So how come all of some of the most creative writers, composers, all of those came from the from being from literally that outside position? Yeah. They were able to look at society from a different point of view. So really genius and creativity is, is being able to look at something from different angle than most people look at it. You're seeing the same thing, but you're seeing it differently. Yes. That's truly what genius is. So people who have their brains wired differently are often seeing the same thing, but they're able to look at it in a different way. Well, Churchill talks about how he's like, um, every, he's like every great person has to come from humanity, yeah. but then he says every prophet also has to go out into the wilderness. Yes. Meaning, like for him, this is like the 10 years he spends outside of power. This is also like the spirit quest or yeah. the, the sort of 
the 40 days and 40 nights. Like yeah. this is, you have to, there has to be some experience or event that changes how you see things that sort of shakes, I think, some of those conventions. Right. Totally. Yeah. You need, you need to be vertically integrated more than you're horizontally integrated. And that it just takes being uh, sort of uh, the wilderness, the wilderness. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like you've had that Ryan or, and uh, Kurt just calling you open with Hercules and you know, he either go, has to go the way of, is it Kakia or Arete? Is that, am I botching the pronunciation? Yeah. So her, the, the choice of Hercules is sort of historically <laughs> the choice between like virtue or vice. You're right. But it's also like, the easy way or the hard way. Yeah. Right. And you've, cho- you've chosen the hard way, I think, pretty yeah, consistently. You, you choose the hard way. Yeah, you have yeah. to. You, I don't think you get good stuff choosing the easy well, way. What, what's interesting is I look at your life and in many ways you're leading what used to be the American dream. Like you have like a nice family, you have a house, you're, you know, and like, like I think about like most millennials I know. Well, and I think like, that's why so many <laughs> of them are unhappy and untethered from yeah. reality because yeah. they, they have like... They rent an apartment. Yes. They travel. Yes. They're not, they, they're sort of, their relationships are all sort Leading. of single serve or ephemeral. Yeah. And they have unlimited options. But the whole point is you have to like choose some of the things and invest in them. And so they have this kind of tenuous connection, not just to reality, but they also have like a tenuous connection to like society. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, like they don't own anything. Mm-hmm. They don't, uh, they're not committed to anything or yeah. anyone. Yeah. And so they're kind of just like adrift. Yeah. You know? Well, it's almost, it's almost as if they inherited the boomer sort of like crazy optimism that the boomers got from the fact that they had all these like economic tailwinds. And so that, that was like a real optimism, um, but without the economic tailwinds. And so yeah. it's like their features don't really make sense, but they still have this like weird indefinite optimism of like, my life's great. I can do whatever I want. And then you wake up and you're like 40 and you're single and you're in your apartment and you're on Tinder and ordering from Postmates. And yes. It's like just so <laughs> depressing. <laughs> no, it's, it's just, it's like, it's almost like meaning comes from scarcity or commitment in some way. Yeah. And so like, if you don't do that, you're kind of just like floating on the surface. Yeah. Which is nice in some sense but it also means you're very uh exposed to like strong winds or you know like you're not yes you're not you're not rooted we were talking earlier about like pain preceding you know real fulfillment or some aristotelian eudaimonia or whatever young people now are just invest in you know this crypto like shiba inu coin or something and they become multi-millionaires overnight and think about what that does dangerous. to your brain. It's super dangerous. Right. It's weird. Yeah, no, it's uh it's it's fantasy world. Mm-hmm. There is something going on with, with technology and computers that's kind of changing people mm-hmm. in ways that can be very scary. So I've read scenarios, I'm not completely convinced mm-hmm. of like where where we're headed in forty years if things continue with people like this with their phones it can't and luck. You know, there's 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 could be some reckoning down the road here you know but the thing that i think about intellectuals it's almost come, become like a dirty word or something mm-hmm. there's this like divorce in american culture between intellectuals and and practical daily life mm. so like i read books from academics on the sublime which should be the most personal exciting book mm-hmm. and they managed to transform it into some kind of garbly <laughs> jargon with this kind of Lacanian speak that has, I can't begin to parse out. How can that, you know, you're talking about the thing that's like the most transformative experience and you're turning it into something meaningless. Yeah. And so much of our academic intellectual culture has so little relevance to what life is actually like on the street. And it used to, wasn't always that way. There used to be so many intellectuals in American life, etc. I just read a biography of William James. Oh, I mean, that's best. that's a hundred years ago, but yeah. we used to have people like that in our culture. You know, totally. intellectuals who were still very much rooted in people's day to day lives. And I feel this like it's almost like schizophrenia, where people are so divorced from reality yeah. in their little in their little zones that they live in. You know, mm-hmm. I'm a professor of this. I, I'm a journalist who only studies this. They each have this, like the the Little blind man citadel. and the elephant. Yeah. They each have their. They each are like tugging at the tail or the toe, and that's what they see as their reality. 
and so few people are actually looking at the whole picture or actually grounded in the whole basic reality of what life is like now and i find that very frightening kind of schizo yeah well we're lucky to have vigilante academics like like you two okay. uh and uh, yeah really appreciate you yeah. both both doing this this is awesome hopefully this video was just the tip of the iceberg and was a good primer for you to dive more deeply into their work clearly these two guys have had a big impact on me my thinking and my career who knows maybe they'll have an impact on you too if you haven't yet please hit subscribe and leave a comment on what you thought was the best part of this video until next time, my name is Jesse Michaels, and this is American Alchemy.